Hi guys, this is the first video in a two-part series on change of variables and multiple integrals. This video is going to be more on the theory side leading up to the formulas for change of variables. In the next video, I'm going to give a number of examples, including examples in polar, cylindrical, and spherical coordinates. In this video, I'm going to start with an intuitive discussion motivated by what we know about change of variables from single integrals. After that, I'm going to move on to multiple integrals, and I'm going to give a relatively rigorous derivation of the formulas for change of variables. Let's start by carefully examining what we know about change of variables for single integrals. When we're evaluating an integral of the form, integral from a to b of f of x dx, it's sometimes useful to make a substitution of the form x equals g of u. Of course, when we do that, the differential dx has to be replaced by g prime of u du, and the original integral becomes the integral from g inverse of a to g inverse of b of f of g of u times g prime of u du. This method of integration is also sometimes called u substitution, and it's really an integral form of the chain rule for differentiation. Technically, it's important for us to assume that the function g is 1 to 1, that way we know what g inverse of a and g inverse of b are, and also that it's differentiable, that way we can compute g prime of u. Also, we want g prime to be continuous, that way we know that the integral on the right-hand side exists. One way to understand what's going on here is to notice that when we make a substitution of this form, there are three things that change. First of all, of course, x gets replaced by g of u. Secondly, the differential dx gets replaced by g prime of u du. And finally, the interval of integration from a to b gets replaced by the interval from g inverse of a to g inverse of b. Let's try to understand the reasons behind these changes, especially behind number two. We're going to see that with multiple integrals, there's an exact analogy with these three changes. First, remember the definition of the definite integral that you learned in calculus. The integral from a to b of f of x dx was defined as a limit of Riemann sums. The way that it worked is you divided the interval from a to b up into n equal segments, each of length delta x, and then inside of each of the segments you picked a point xi star. You considered the sum of f of xi star times delta x. Each one of these terms represents the area of a rectangle with width delta x and height f of xi star. So the sum gives you an approximation to the area under the curve. And then you took the limit as n tends to infinity. Similarly with the other definite integral that we're considering, this one may look a lot more complicated, but it's really the same formula, just with a different integrand and with different limits of integration. One thing that's worth mentioning here in light of what we're about to say, when you define the definite integral this way, you don't necessarily have to take subintervals that are all the same length. The lengths of the subintervals can vary as long as they all tend to zero as n tends to infinity. Let's think about what happens when we apply the function g to each one of the subintervals in the interval from g inverse a to g inverse b. The quantity delta x is g of ui plus delta u minus g of ui. When delta u is small, we can see that this quantity is approximately equal to g prime at ui times delta u. This follows directly from the definition of the derivative of g evaluated at ui. Coming back to our Riemann sums, the knowledge that delta x is approximately equal to g prime of ui times delta u when delta u is small tells us that when n is large, the Riemann sum on the left is approximately equal to the Riemann sum on the right. You might also want to notice that when delta u is small, delta x is approximately equal to g prime of ui star for any ui star in that interval by the same argument that we gave before. In any case, when we take the limit as n tends to infinity, we get exactly the formula that we were aiming for. This gives an intuitive but also somewhat rigorous explanation of where the formula for change of variables and single integrals comes from. All of the intuitive arguments that we've seen generalize to dimensions 2 and higher. But before we look at the details of those arguments in higher dimensions, let's go ahead and spoil the surprise by showing one of the end products, the change of variables formula for double integrals. Let's suppose we're trying to compute the double integral of a function f of two variables x and y over a region d in the plane. If we make a change of variables by setting x equal to g of u v and y equal to h of u v for some new variables u and v, our original double integral becomes the double integral over a region R of f of gh times the absolute value of the determinant of the Jacobian matrix du dv. I'll explain what the determinant of the Jacobian is as we go along. To understand what the region R is, let's write t for the transformation that takes points in uv coordinates to points in xy coordinates according to this rule. In order for this formula to be valid, just like we saw in the single variable case, we need to make some assumptions about the transformation t. Here we're going to assume that it's 1 to 1, that it maps the region R onto the region D, and that the first partial derivatives of the function g and h exist and are continuous. The reasons for these assumptions are the same as for the analogous assumptions in the one variable case. 
Now it's clear that just as in the one variable case, there are three things that change when we make a change of variables in a double integral. First of all, xy gets replaced by some new functions of new parameters u and v. Secondly, the differential dA, or dx dy if you like, gets replaced by a new differential, which involves this determinant of the Jacobian that I have yet to explain. And third, the region D gets replaced by a new region R. Let's take a moment to try to look under the hood to see what this formula means and why it's true. Here's a picture analogous to the interval picture that we had when we were talking about Riemann sums in one dimension. When we define the double integral over our region R, say, we divide the region up into very small rectangles. Then we pick a point ui star vi star inside of each one of those rectangles, and we use those points to build a two-dimensional Riemann sum which we can then use to define the double integral. Just like we did in the one-dimensional case, let's zoom in and see what the transformation t does to a small rectangle like that. Zooming in, let's label the lower left-hand corner of the rectangle as ui vi, and let's write delta v and delta u for the side lengths of the rectangle. Suppose the transformation t maps these three corners of the rectangle to the points indicated by the corresponding colors in the region D, and write a and b for the vectors connecting the orange point in the region D to the red and green points respectively. More explicitly, a and b are given by the formulas you see here. I'm not going to read these out, but you can just look at them and check to see that they're correct. One thing to notice about these formulas, which is reminiscent of what happened in the one-dimensional case, is that, for example, when you look at the first coordinate of a, you see that when delta u is very small, it's very close to the partial derivative of g with respect to u evaluated at uivi times delta u. Similarly, the second coordinate of a is very close to the partial of h with respect to u evaluated at uivi times delta u. Similarly for b, when delta v is very small, the vector b is very close to the partial of g with respect to v evaluated at uivi times delta v, comma, the partial of h with respect to v evaluated at uivi times delta v. I've recorded that information right here. If I call the area of the region on the right-hand side delta A, then delta A is approximately equal to the area of the parallelogram determined by A and B. It may not look like that's true from the picture that I've drawn here, but as delta U and delta V tend to zero, the area of this region will get closer and closer to the area of this parallelogram. I'm gonna leave it for you as an exercise to verify that the area of the parallelogram determined by two vectors in R2 is the absolute value of the determinant of the two by two matrix that you get by using the entries of those vectors as the rows of the matrix. In other words, the area of the parallelogram determined by A and B is the absolute value of the first entry of A times the second entry of B minus the second entry of A times the first entry of B. Once you write that out and factor out the common delta U delta V factor, you get exactly the formula that I've written here. I'm going to write partial of xy divided by partial of uv for the quantity inside the absolute values here. So partial of xy with respect to partial of u is just the determinant of the 2 by 2 matrix whose entries are partial of g with respect to u, partial of g with respect to v, partial of h with respect to u, partial of h with respect to v. That matrix is the Jacobian matrix that I mentioned before. Substituting that approximation for delta A into the appropriate Riemann sums, and then taking the limit as the partition in the Riemann sums becomes finer and finer, gives us precisely the formula for change of variables and double integrals that we saw before. Here's the formula one more time with the relevant hypotheses indicated and with the definition of the Jacobian determinant, or the determinant of the Jacobian matrix here at the bottom. Just to reiterate what I said before, when you make a substitution of the form x equals g of uv and y equals h of uv, there are three things that change. Number one, the integrand. Number two, the differential. And number three, the region of integration. There are similar formulas for change of variables in dimensions bigger than two. In three dimensions, if we have a triple integral of f of x, y, z, dv, and we make a change of variables x equals r of u, v, w, y equals s of uvw, and z equals t of uvw, then under suitable hypotheses, the integral transforms in a similar way. The integrand changes, the differential changes, and the region of integration changes. To figure out how the differential changes, you need to know how to compute the Jacobian of a transformation in R3. The way to do that is exactly analogous to the way that you did it in two dimensions. You take your three functions, one at a time, and compute the partial derivatives of each one with respect to each one of the new variables. Then you take the determinant of that matrix. In the next video, I'm going to give several examples of change of variables in double and triple integrals, and I'm going to try to illustrate the different reasons why you might want to make changes of variables to evaluate certain integrals. Thank you for watching, and I hope this video was helpful for you. When the next video is ready, I'll post a link to it below.